All right, guys. Well, imagine that. It is a gray, gloomy, rainy, yuck, depressing day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on Labor Day weekend, Sunday, September, where are we, 6, 2021, somewhere around there. It is September 5th, 2021, I guess, somewhere in that area. But since it is Sunday morning, doing what I try to do every Sunday morning, and that is bringing you my doomsday sermon. And this is the third time I have referenced this, uh, one of the most spot-on essays I have ever read in the Doomosphere. Twelve years now in here, uh, reading selections from people. Uh, in my Doomsday Sermons, if you read one thing this year, if you are trying to understand why we are doomed and there is no hope left on this planet, you have got to come over here and read this article showing up on this outfit, which I guess is a journal of just various essays called MDPI. And for the third time in three or four days, uh, once again, this is going to be this essay titled, Through the Eye of a Needle, an Eco-Heterodox, whatever that means, perspective on the renewable energy transition in which uh, <clears throat> there's two authors of this essay. I have to admit a voice I have never heard of before, a some doomer chick named Megan K. Siebert teaming up with my hero, Professor William Reese, uh, to spell out uh, why, why we're doomed and why this uh, whole BS energy transition to a, you know, from fossil fuels to a clean, green, sustainable energy transition is, as what Andy the Gardener says, the single biggest delusion of the humans in the 21st century. It, it, it is the single biggest bright green lie. So this is Megan and William Reese's version of Derek Jensen and Lecaire, Le, Le, Lear Keith's book, Bright Green Lies, just all summarized. So before I go in, so who are, who is Megan Siebert? I wish Megan Siebert was my girlfriend, but shh, don't tell her that. <clears throat> Megan Siebert is the executive director of the Real Green New Deal Project. Megan is a systems thinker who started Real Green New Deal in response to the overwhelmingly short-sighted rhetoric about energy and sustainability, filling a need for sober analysis and bold truth telling. So it is no wonder that Megan has uh, teamed up with Dr. William Reese. I, once again, I want to uh, turn you over to my interview a couple of years ago with Dr. William Reese, which I think is one of the best uh, interviews ever on Collapse Chronicles. For those of you not familiar with who <coughs> Dr. William Reese is, Dr. Reese is a human ecologist, ecological economist, and professor emeritus and former director of the University of British Columbia's School of Community and Regional Planning in Vancouver, where his research and teaching focused on the biophysical prerequisites for sustainability in an era of accelerating <clears throat> ecological change. He has a special interest in the ecologically relevant metrics of sustainability and their interpretations. 
Uh, Dr. Reese is perhaps best known as the originator and co-developer of the ecological footprint analysis, uh, which of course <clears throat> has been co-opted by a subset of the ecological footprint, the carbon footprint, which is one part of the ecological footprint, as I'm sure they're going to discuss in there. So anyway, guys, <clears throat> I'm going to put the link on here to this, and I highly suggest you just shut me up and go read this yourself. There's like a hundred or more you know, citations of other studies backing up their conclusions. <clears throat> but if you just want to sit around and listen to me read this for you, I will be happy to do that. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to read the beginning, the abstract, and the introduction, and maybe the first couple of chapters, and then turn it over to you. So we have already <clears throat> heard the chapter on uh, the need for population reduction and in, uh, in the video I did on Thursday uh, where they are recommending getting this planet down to below one billion people. So we've already been over that. So let's just <clears throat> check out uh, the opening of this. And, and I'm going to go on. I might just talk until the camera runs out. Uh, but anyway, take it away, <clears throat> Megan and Siebert. Okay, so in, you know, in this report, we add to the emerging body of literature highlighting cracks in the foundation of the mainstream energy transition narrative. We offer an analysis that recharacterizes the climate crisis with its broader context of ecological overshoot highlighting numerous collectively fatal problems with the so-called renewable energy technologies and suggest alternative solutions that entail a contraction of the human enterprise. This analysis makes clear <coughs> that the pat notion of, quote, affordable clean energy views the world through a narrow keyhole that is blind <clears throat> to innumerable economic, ecological, and social costs. <clears throat> These undesirable externalities can no longer be ignored. To achieve sustainability and salvage civilization, and once again, I need to break in here. I understand that some of us listening to this do not want to salvage civilization. Okay, so they're actually talking to the people who still do want to salvage civilization. But whether you personally uh, want to salvage civilization or see civilization go down the toilet because it's civilization, that's the problem. Uh, it doesn't really detract <clears throat> from this sermon. To achieve sustainability and salvage civilization, society must embark on a planned, cooperative descent from an extreme state of overshoot, otherwise known as the plague phase of our species, as Dr. Reese calls it, a cooperative descent from an extreme state of overshoot in just a decade or two. While it might be easier for the proverbial camel to pass through the eye of the needle, than for global society to succeed in this endeavor, history is replete with stellar achievements that have arisen only from a dogged pursuit of the seemingly impossible. And so after that ridiculous uh, 
little wink, wink, nudge, nudge uh, to the hopium pipe. You know, I, I mean, I don't know who this Megan chick is, but as I was saying yesterday in my hopium roundup, <clears throat> William Reese knows damn well that humanity is not going to rise to this challenge. <clears throat> okay, but anyway, so they, they spit out that little kernel of hopium, and then for the next hour and a half, uh, they descend into a reality check, uh, neutralizing any hint of hopium. <clears throat> so let's, this chapter one, all right. <clears throat> we begin with a reminder that humans are storytellers by nature. We socially construct complex sets of facts, beliefs, and values that guide how we operate in the world. Indeed, humans act out of their socially constructed narratives as if they were real. All all political ideologies, religious doctrines, economic paradigms, cultural narratives, even scientific theories hmm, are socially constructed stories that may or may not accurately reflect any aspect of reality they purport to represent. Once a particular construct, you know, being it political, religious, economic, cultural, or even scientific, once a particular construct has taken hold, its adherents are likely to treat it more seriously than opposing evidence from an alternate conceptual framework. Hmm. The Green New Deal, mm. the Green New Deal is the dominant aspirational pathway in the mainstream narrative for achieving socially just ecological sustainability. Its central message is that a smooth transition away from climate hostile fossil fuels is a relatively simple technological matter. Not only do its proponents claim that electrification of all energy consumption by means of high-tech wind tar turbines and solar panels is technically possible, but that such a vast and unprecedented replacement of society's entrenched energy foundation is both financially feasible and carries the added benefit of creating thousands of green, green jobs. The only missing ingredient, we are told, is political will. Energy transition plans produced by numerous academic institutions and researchers around the world support or confirm obediently to the Green New Deal paradigm, and politicians everywhere have taken up the Green New Deal banner as the core of their environmental pledges. We argue that while the Green New Deal narrative is highly seductive, it is little more than a disastrous shared illusion. That is exactly what it is. Not only is the Green New Deal technically flawed, but it fails to recognize human ecological dysfunction as the overall driver of incipient global systemic collapse. By viewing climate change rather than ecological overshoot, of which climate change is merely one symptom, 
as the central problem, the Green New Deal and its variants grasp in vain for techno-industrial solutions to problems caused by the techno-industrial society. Such a self-referencing pursuit is doomed to fail. As Albert Einstein allegedly said, quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, close quote. We need an entirely new narrative for a successful energy transition only by abandoning the flawed paradigmatic source of our ecological dilemma can we formulate realistic pathways for averting social ecological collapse. Okay, so now we're going to read chapter two. All right, and see if we have time for chapter three. Uh, okay, chapter two, climate change in the context of overshoot. You know, I think that uh, perhaps uh, Book Hermit uh, it was one of the hidden co-authors of this. I think this is what Book Hermit's been trying to tell us for the past several years. <clears throat> Long-standing calls from ecologists and informed environmentalists for society to adopt a systems perspective and employ a multidisciplinary approach to anthropogenic climate change have largely fallen on deaf ears. Most people have succumbed to the mechanistic reductionist paradigm that has dominated Cartesian science, as is evident by the isolation of climate change, the isolation of climate from its broader ecological context and treatment of climate as a discrete, independent variable, the reality is that climate change is only one symptom of a system's destabilization as the human enterprise has come to overwhelm the ecosphere. To recalibrate our focal lens. Yes, little dog, we are going to recalibrate our focal lens. Consider, consider the following accelerating changes. <clears throat> the population of Homo sapiens, <clears throat> which we went into a lot more detail in on Thursday, the population of Homo sapiens is nearly eight times larger than it was at the beginning of the fossil fueled industrial age a mere 200 years ago, and it has been growing nearly 20 times faster, you know, since we brought in fossil fuels. <clears throat> to accommodate this explosion of humanity, over half the land surface of Earth has been substantially modified, particularly for agriculture, that most ecologically destructive of technologies. <clears throat> One consequence of this is the competitive displacement of non-human species from their habitats and food sources. Prior to the dawn of agriculture eight to ten millennia ago, <clears throat> humans accounted for less than one percent and wild mammals 99 percent of mammalian biomass on earth. Today, humans constitute 36 percent and our domestic livestock another 60 percent of a much expanded mammalian biomass compared with only 4% for all the other wild species combined. Uh, 
one study estimates that the population of non-human vertebrate species declined by 58 percent between 1970 and 2012 alone. Freshwater, marine, and terrestrial vertebrate populations declined by 81 percent, 36 percent, and 38 percent respectively, and invertebrate invertebrate populations fell by about 50 percent. While fossil fuels, coal, and later oil and natural gas have been humanity's major source of energy over the past two centuries, 50 percent of all fossil fuels ever burned have been consumed in just the past 30 years and as much as 90 percent since the early 1940s as super exponential growth has taken hold. It should be no surprise, therefore, that carbon dioxide emissions, the major material byproduct of fossil fuel combustion and the principal anthropogenic driver of climate change, have long exceeded photosynthetic uptake by green plants. By 1997, when annual consumption was 40 percent less than this year, humanity was already burning fossil fuels containing about 422 times the net amount of carbon fixed by photosynthesis globally each year. Between 1800 and this year, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations increased by 48 percent from 280 parts per million to approximately 415 parts per million. These data show that plunging biodiversity and climate change along with air, land, and ocean pollution, deforestation, desertification, incipient resource scarcity, etc., are the inevitable consequences, indeed parallel symptoms of the same root phenomenon, the spectacular and continuing growth of the human enterprise on a finite planet. Homo sapiens is in overshoot, exploiting ecosystems beyond their regenerative and assimilative capacities. Overshoot is possible only because of a. the short-term availability of prodigious stocks of both renewable, can you say fish, forest, soil, etc., and non-renewable, can you say coal, oil, natural gas, etc., forms of so-called, quote, natural capital, and B. B, remember, overshoot is possible only because of, now, B, the enormous but finite natural waste assimilation and recycling processes of the ecosphere. However, a reckoning is at hand. In just a few decades of geometric population and economic growth, humans have exploited often to collapse natural capital stocks that took millennia to accumulate and have impeded natural life support processes through excessive, often toxic, waste discharges. The human enterprise now uses the bioproductive and assimilative capacities of 1.75 Earth equivalents Earth equivalents. In simple terms, the industrial world's ecological predicament is the result of 
too many people consuming too much and over polluting the ecosphere. Clearly, the climate crisis cannot be solved in isolation from the macro problem of overshoot. Certainly not by using technologies that are reliant on the same fossil fuels and ecologically destructive processes that created the problem in the first place. And I should probably wrap this up here. So what I'm going to do, guys, uh, for some reason, I'm going to break off here, and we're going to make this a two-part sermon, or I guess a three-part since uh, Thursdays. So we're going to come back in part two and talk about problems with so-called renewables. Uh, good. Which is the the, the central focus of uh, of this is is this middle part where this is their version of uh, bright green lies. Uh, good Lord, and. Uh, We're going to come back in part two and read uh, some of this uh, reality check on problems with so-called renewables coming up in one minute. I got some bad news for you, little dog. This is a two-part sermon coming right back at you. Bye, guys.